Thank, thanks a lot, and uh, thank you for invi inviting me also. Um, so I, I just want to start by just showing what my computer game is about. And it's, it's, it's more or less about this bottle of water here and being able to move it quickly from here to here. And that's the scientific challenge that we want to solve, not with water, but with atoms, picking up atoms and being able to move them quickly without having sloshing in the end. And so so I'll, I'll go through a little bit of our, our considerations and for the, for the physicists here, I'll apologize for not going into detail with the physics. And for the computer science people, I'll in, uh, have to apologize for being very naive when I talk about computer science. And hopefully there are no educational science people here because I'm even more naive on that topic. Um, Okay, so, so uh, Sabrina has already, already talked a little bit about the, the main goals or some of the goals that are in the field of, of this uh, gamification process. And, uh, and the second process, the same second goal that we have here, uh, unlike what Sandy talked about before, we really aim at making the, the players understand the physics that is behind because we hope that in understanding the physics, they will become better players and they will generate better results for us. So, in principle, uh, that's as, as another path then to, to that. And, and in terms of the uh, teaching of the gamification of the education, we have one main hypothesis that we are testing right now in high schools around Denmark, um, and that is that being a scientist, we can present the curriculum in a manner which is much more motivating than the high school teachers can. Not because we are better at presenting or at being educational, but just because we can present the problems much more authentic. Okay, so, so when, when you do this gamification, there's always a strategy, which is you take a physics concept, in our case the quantum computer, you take some of the elements from the computer games, you take something from the community effort, and then you get your game. And our game is the quantum computer game, and we're working on this in, in the context of a center uh, for community-driven research. So, so in the coming couple of minutes, I will just go through a little bit of uh, a background of uh, human computing. And I know that people uh, in this room will probably know more than me about some of these things. So I'll just be very brief and just so that we have a common understanding of of the topic. So, so human computing uh, was born more or less with the city at home effort that people don't understand and Wikipedia has changed all of our lives on the internet, right? So you can group it largely in two different, uh, in two different categories. One is the games and the efforts with a purpose and the second ones that we're interested in here are the ga science games. And within this you can subdivide it into three different groups here. So one group like a city at home that just utilizes the computational power. Then the second, a little bit more advanced one, that uses human pattern recognition uh, and intuition in order to perform trivial tasks. And then perhaps the most interesting one here, where we really want to enlist the players to do really hard scientific problems. And when you mention human computing, I always uh, go back to Louis Van Aan here, because he's really one of the forefathers of the field, I think, and, and, and uh, he invented these captures. You all know the distorted text that you need to write. And, and he has a site that's called gwap.com. Do you all know this site? OK, then I'm happy that I brought it. So gwap.com, gameswithapurpose.com, where he has small games that you can play uh, that do something good. And, and, and one of the games that he has is, is called the ESP game. The ESP game is all about labeling images on the internet. And here comes the important that I talked to Sandy about. Having a two-player game can make people do really uh, uh, fairly trivial tasks. The trivial task here is you're presented with a picture, and then you have two players around the internet, and you're supposed to both come up with the same name or the same name for that picture. So, so we get a picture like this one here with a baby. I try to type baby, and if the other guy also types baby, then we get points. In this case, he didn't, but we matched on play, and then we got our points. And he has more than 20,000 people playing this, and the mission of that is to put a label on every image on the internet. Okay, so, so, so I think that's very cool. Um, in terms of science, there's a site called Zoo Universe. I guess I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but, but that's a, a conglomerate of different types of fairly easy science games. So, so you can go through that site, and then you can start to... Uh, find galaxies, you can find extraterrestrial planets uh, and Earth-like uh, uh, suns, and you can go into nature games where you can survey the bottom of the ocean in order to find different types of fish and categorize all of that. 
And they have a common, so they have a common uh, uh, interface where you can go in and, and, and play these games. Uh, here, I just wanted to show, show briefly one of these games, which illustrates that the tasks here are fairly trivial. So here you see some, some cells, and then the, the task is to identify whether or not uh, you have cancer cells here. Okay. And then, of course, you all know folded, or uh, probably know folded, uh, which is then something that belongs to these hard-to-solve science tasks. And they've been very successful. And one of the main points is really that they have been successful in finding a few players <laughs> who have new algorithms, have come up with new algorithms that really have been shown to be able to solve other problems than the ones that the algorithm was developed for. So that's really where we can see that they have helped do something that, that, that computers haven't been able to do. So they've gone beyond artificial intelligence. And in uh, writing this algorithm or, or, or uh, finding this algorithm, they've also made art artificial intelligence more intelligent. So that's also some feedback that, that's going on there that I think is very interesting. Um, yeah, I think you can, so, so you can go and play the game. Um, I just want to intro introduce a couple of the partners that we have in our center. So there's myself as the director. Uh, and coming from the physics side, we have another partner from the physics side, Klaus Müllmer, that some of you may know from physics. Then we have a professor at the computer science department, and we have someone, someone from the educational science department also. So apart from that, we are trying to expand it a little bit and try to look at the problem from many different sides. And I just want to illustrate that now here. So we have our quantum games, and then we have the physics part of it here. And then, of course, we have the didactics of that that we're also interested in. We have people interested in that. But apart from that, we're trying to collect experiences from, from different uh, fields of, of knowledge and, and, and have different... So we have drama studies. Um, we have people from psychology, anthropology, ethnographical studies. They're interested in reward structures and how the uh, group um, formation can work. And we even have people doing cognitive research who are really interested in the process of decision making and stress response and things like that and where we can work together to, to, uh, to solve different various scientific challenges, not only the physics challenge challenges, but really meet and all have uh, common interests around this. Okay, so, so I just want to briefly outline then some of the, for our design considerations that we had then in formulating then what are the goals? Well, first of all, uh, like many of these types of games, it's a parameter search game. So we want many players to do these parameter searches. Just like Folded, we hope to find some players who have these unique skills of pattern recognition or intuition, and then they find these optimization algorithms. What I think I would like to highlight here is that what I see as one of the biggest potentials of this approach here is that if we involve the users in the, in the design process, so participatory design, then we could potentially move in directions or research directions that we wouldn't as phys physicists be able to come up with. And I think that's where I maybe put a lot of emphasis on educating the players because at some point I hope they become smarter than me and think, think of some, some science problems that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, why do we hope that we, they will play this game? Well, we will do all that we can to steal from, from Facebook, right? So it will be easy arcade-type games. Uh, there will be individual competition on high scores. There will be groups collaborating. There can be groups also uh, working against each other. And that, that's where I think this social structure can be, both in the multiplayer game, but it can also be in single-player games. But then when out of game, social interactions also, I think, can be a huge motivational factor. But what I see as the biggest incentive is that we continually <coughs> tell the players that they contribute to science. So I, the game that I will show you in just a minute is not extremely fun, but I really hope that we can keep telling them that they, uh, that they contribute to science and in that way get this retention where they keep playing it, hopefully. So that will be the main part. And that's also why I fear hiding the physics, because then I fear that we won't be making good enough games. So, so this is a slightly more uh, complicated software overview then of uh, the, 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 the scheme or the, 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 the long-term goals of this. So we will have quantum mechanics games, small games that, that introduce quantum mechanical uh, effects that you need to 
understand in order to solve these scientific challenges. So we'll have a user development interface where players can define their own games. Players or teachers can define their own games. They can be canonized into games uh, that are then played in the community, which means there could be potentially a lot of people who just cycle around here and just learn physics because it's fun. Uh, that, would be, uh, that would be one goal uh, and that, that we've achieved. But of course, we hope that some of them will go over here and play some of these science games. And then we're also working on a, a slightly more nerdy scientific development interface where we take different uh, theoretical mathematical models. So for now, we have um, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, for those who know what that is, Bosa Hubbard, Gross Petyevsky, and trying to uh, build a graphical user interface on this here with the dual purpose, first of all, we can give it to scientists and they can simulate their own experiments or they can make their own thought experiments, come up with new ideas, and potentially some of these ideas that they come up with can be just solved uh, right away or they can be posed as problems in a user development interface that can be then fed back to new scientific games for the community to solve. So that's a little bit of the uh, ecology of, uh, that we are imagining in, in, in the science at home. Okay, so, so before I bore you a little bit with the background, I just want to show you a little bit about the game. So, so, so here's a little bit about the game mechanics. I told you it's all about taking something in a container, moving it as quickly as possible from one location to another location. Now this here blue thing, it's blue because it looks like water, and this is in reality an atom, and it's the wave function, and we continually solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation as the player is allowed to then deform the potential landscape. So I'll explain a little bit about the physics background then of the challenge that we have here. So you all know that computers have been developing really quickly over the past 50 years from something that none of us were alive to see uh, and then to something that is really small. And that's something that has been accompanied by or driven by the exponential decrease in the size of transistors that you probably know as the Morse law. So, so, so the, this has been a, a great benefit in many years, but at some point the, backs, the, the downside of that is that we enter this quantum machine. So that means that quantum effects will start to be important at the size of single transistor. And that's actually already a problem now because when we have the wires and electrons are actually already starting to tunnel, quantum mechanically tunnel from one wire to another. So, so they are, the chip designers are, are working on different things to do it, and another way is just to jump to another paradigm of computing, and that would be quantum computing. So in order to illustrate what quantum computing is, and now I, this is where I apologize to physicists, uh, because I try to illustrate a little bit about the power of quantum computation. So we, we all have uh, two hands, and that would be like the bits, the zeros and the ones, and if we take one person, then we have two different possibilities of one show of hands, right? And if we take, every time we take one more, then we have two more possibilities, right? And so you all understand probably that this is then the exponential growth that we get, two to the nth different possibilities of shows of hands. And, and what I still find a little bit hard to, to, to understand is that if we were 300 people in this room and we were all allowed to raise one hand, then there would be more possibilities for us to raise hands than there are atoms in the whole universe. And I think that's the power to the quantum computer that is really fantastic. And how can we take advantage of that in a, in a quantum computer? Well, a classical computer for me is just a black box. There are some zeros and ones that come in, and then there's a function calculated on these zeros and ones based on the In quantum mechanics, the only quantum mechanics that I'll be talking about today is also the cat that people may know. So the quantum system that we have can exist in two states, and two, in, in different states at once, which means if we have a two-level system like the qubit, uh, then it can be in both the zero and the one at the same time. And now, again, for you and for me, maybe, uh, right now the, the quantum computer can just be a black box, but now the input are these qubits, which means that if we have four, then we have 16 different states that we can represent at the same time, and the black box calculates for us 16 different outputs. If we had 300 of those, we would be calculating more values in a single step than the atoms in the whole universe. And that's the power of the quantum computer. So people who know quantum computers know that the story is not quite that simple. Uh, there are caveats, uh, but the basic is that you really can do tasks that no computers in the world can do combined. And one of these tasks is, is prime number factoring, and that means that you'll be able to break much of the internet security if you had a large-scale quantum computer today. And that's why lots of money is being fed into, into research here. And it's also difficult. 
so, so I just want to give you just a brief state of the art on, on quantum computers. They have been in existence for, for more than a decade now. And the first one was based on organic molecules, and they had seven of these qubits, and they did the calculation 3 times 5 is equal to 15. So, so that's the prime number of factoring that you see here, and if you could scale that up, that would be very interesting. Right now, it's not that impressive. And then for the last 10 years, people have been really working on it in different labs to try to implement in different systems here. Quantum computation has been implemented in different systems, but this record today is still only 14 qubits. And 2 to the 14th is still not a very large number. Okay, so we need to expand that to hundreds or thousands of qubits, but unlike regular computers, we don't need to expand it to billions of qubits. So, so, so that's where the hope is, that if we can just expand this year by a couple of orders of magnitude, then we'll have a really fantastic computer. The reason that they haven't succeeded yet, and I've also tried to build one of these, and it's really difficult. Uh, and and so, so there are lots of technical challenges, and that's where the idea for the quantum computer game comes. Try to help solve some of these uh, fairly basic optimizational challenges but they're just unsolved challenges on the way. Um, and in order to see what do you need to do in order to build a quantum computer, you need to do three things. First of all, you need to have these uh, hundreds or thousands of qubits. You need the ability to flip individual qubits, so zero to one or anything in between, and that's where uh, Sabrina's uh, block sphere comes into the picture because you need to be able to make any state between a zero and a one, not only zeros and ones at the same time. And then you need to do something that is called a two-qubit operation. And for all the computer science op scientists, you know that there are NAND gates and NOR gates that are universal in, in, in making the software on this computer here. And in exactly the same way, if you can implement one of these two-qubit gates along with the single-bit gates, then it's universal for quantum computation. Which means I take all of these three steps together, and then I can build any sort of quantum computation code. Which means it's fantastic from an experimental point of view because in order to claim that I have a quantum computer, I don't need to make a fairly, very complicated program. I just need to be able to do all of these three things, and then I can say that it's an engineering task to do it well, okay? And, and it's the proof of principle that, that I'm concerned about right now. So in my postdoc in Germany, uh, I worked a little bit on setting up an experiment that had um, artificial, an artificial egg tray-like potential for atoms where we could put individual atoms into each of these egg tray uh, wells. So that's the picture here where, you show, where we show that we could really put in individual single atoms into the wells. And we produced the coldest crystal in the world, fairly cold. Uh, and then a little bit later, we managed then to shine in an optical uh, tweezer of light, so a laser beam that was just focused on a single site and showed that we could flip qubits from zero to one or anything in between. And you can see here some patterns that we were able to write then using this, uh, you could say, quantum dot matrix printer. OK, so, so that means that uh, in our experimental work, we've solved number one. We have 300 atoms at our disposal. They are individual atoms. They are individually addressable. Very good. And now the, we only need to solve this second challenge of bringing two together and somehow making this two qubit gate, which we haven't done yet because it's really difficult. And for the, uh, for the Scottish pride of people, I just want to mention that, that this is something that was done together with, uh, in the lab of uh, Stefan Kur, who's now at Strathclyde. So, so very soon he'll get everything to work and he'll be doing more fantastic results in, in this direction here. Okay, so, so, so that's the remaining operation. We, we, uh, we, we didn't manage to do it, but we came up with at least a theoretical way to do it. So the theoretical way to do it was I took my crystal and then I, I blow away some lines here and then I have transport lanes here. And then in principle, I just need to be able to pick up this one atom here, transport it to here and then over to here and then we can make an interaction, we can make the gate, okay? So, so, so the challenge here, now we come back to my water because the uh, atom should not be thought of as a ball. The atom is described by a wave function. Some of you know that. And the wave function is something that can behave very much like the water here. And that's why the challenge is very analog analogous to just taking a glass of water and moving it and avoiding the sloshing. Technically, sloshing means admixture of higher excited states, and higher excited states means errors in the computation. Okay. So, so, so that, was the, that was the fairly trivial explanation. Uh, I'll just spend two minutes for the physicist to, to talk a little bit more in detail about the, the real challenge and the real thing, um, what, we, what we had to do. 
So, so the challenge is to have a Gaussian indentation, so a Gaussian potential indentation. We have the atom there, and then we want to transport it. And this is something that can be solved uh, for a harmonic oscillator model, and then you just linearly transport this, translate this, and if you translate it using the adiabaticity continuum, it's not that important, but then you can get a closed analytic expression that looks like this for the error probability as a function of the total transport time. And you get something like a sinusoidal oscillation here. And then we did it solving the, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the real potential, uh, and we see this oscillation here as a function of the total time of transport. And uh, what we want to do is then go to one of these minima here, which means low error probability, fast transport. And the problem that we encountered was that unlike this closed expression here, the infidelity or the error probability doesn't go down to zero. It's actually fairly high, 10 to minus 1, so 10% error if we go to these fast things. So what we did was, instead of moving it just linearly as we did in the beginning, then we defined some parameter space where we can define it non-linearly, uh, and then we did numerical optimization on that. And a very simple numerical optimization then gave us these minima here at uh, 10 to minus 4 or 10 to minus 5 error probability. Sorry, this is, this is becoming more than two minutes, but I'm almost finished. So this is this, we did almost the same now for the two qubit gate, where you pick up an atom, you have another atom, you treat the interaction correctly, and then you can optimize these paths, and then you get high fidelity in very low time. And that means that overall we can make fast gates uh, with low error probability, which was good news. But being experimentalists also, we also said, well, we have to, we have to also model experimental errors which was a very bad idea for, for, for our mood. Uh, because what we, what we also wanted to model was then the positioning error. So if I, I don't think that it works, no. But uh, when you have a laser and you try to position it, then it's shaking just a little bit. That will be a position error. And the intensity will also be fluctuating. So we calculated the, the uh, error probability here as a function of these errors here. And, uh, and uh, you see here, so, so that's, uh, that's 10 to minus 3, and 2 times 10 to minus 3, and 3 times 10 to minus 3. So you want to be with a precision of the order of nanometer or something like that. And unfortunately, our precision, the state-of-the-art precision, was really 50 nanometers, which puts us all the way out to that tree over there. So we have huge error probabilities for, and we tried to optimize this, and we couldn't really optimize it. And that's the physical explanation of the problem that we want to solve. We want to try to give people the uh, possibility of solving this motion in the presence of these noise sources and see if they can come up with, uh, with motional paths that are robust against all noise sources. Open question. OK, so, so uh, this is all something that we're doing in the context. We have a website, which is called scienceathome.org, um, where we have a, a little out view or outline of our different activities here. Uh, there's a small preview that you can go in and log in and play. So we have seven of our levels um, that are just indicative of, of the game mechanics that we have. We also have an introduction for scientists where we explain in a little bit more detail what some of the scientific challenges are and some of the next steps that we're also working on. Okay, so, so, so now we're ready to, to again see, see the, uh, the scientific, or at least one of the scientific challenges. So, so here we have the atom. It's being transported. Uh, you may notice here a small indentation. That was the well that the atom was in the beginning, and then there was another indentation here for another well, and we wanted to move it from one well to another well while preserving this Gaussian shape here, which is the ground state of the, uh, of the atom and the potential. Okay, so, 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 so that illustrates one part of the game mechanics. Now, if you think this looks nerdy and, and uninteresting, it gets even worse now because, uh, because we also want to give them possibilities of abstractly controlling now. So, so, I talked to, so you saw that what you could control in the game before here was the position of this tweezer here and the depth of this tweezer here, so a two-dimensional space. Okay, so, so I, as a physicist, I wouldn't play that game a lot. I would play this game here. Where, where, you see, where you see the intensity as a function of time, and you see the amplitude as a function of time. And now I want to manipulate this here, and then get the score updated live. Right? And that's, that's what, what, uh, what this sort of cockpit-type cockpit type, uh, panel will do for you, where you can globally manipulate now the total path, and you always live see an update then of your score here. And you can also uh, 
uh, get unlock then different types of tools and uh, and see. So so you can see that we are not afraid of nerdiness in 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 this approach here, and and we are hoping that it will really, really help um, uh, to 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 make these tools available. And we're hoping that some of them will actually, the players will actually want to go here because that's where the most efficient optimization will be done. Okay, so, sorry, yeah, let me just see if I can show you. Uh, so, we don't have the problem that our, oops, yeah. We don't have the problem that our game is too trivial. We actually have the problem that our game is extremely difficult. Uh, so, so we, we also have difficulties with the curve that Sandy was talking about. Uh, and we need to define levels that actually make it easier uh, in order to pro progress into to the games that are really difficult. Let me just, uh, let me just show you the, one of the most difficult games that we, that we have, and that's uh, the merging of two atoms. So now we have one atom here, we have an atom over here, and the idea is dump them into the same well, such that now technically one of them is in the ground state, the other one is in the first excited state. Okay, so that means that I should dump them in there, and in the end they should not be moving. Uh, so I, I take that, and I'm, I'm already moving, uh, and now I'm supposed to dump them in there, and they're supposed to be absolutely still, and I press here, and I'm supposed to get 100%. So that's a really difficult, that's a really difficult challenge. And so, so that's what we're working on, making sub-levels or in introductory levels that really make it a little bit more, a little bit more easy. Uh, Okay, so now I want to switch a little bit gears and talk a little bit about education. So, first of all, we are interested in taking all of these concepts into high schools. But second of all, as I talked about, for me as a scientist, I think that, that in order to get anything out of my online game, I would like to educate the student, educate the players a lot. And that's why we are testing some of these small visualization schemes in the context of high schools. So gamification of, of education, why should you do it? So, so here, here comes my very naive uh, interpretation of why to do it. So roughly you can group the students that you have in any school into two groups. One, which is you can call mastery oriented. Mastery oriented students are, are really nice to have. They are intrinsically motivated. They want to learn in order to be good. Okay? Then you have the performance uh, oriented students and they are extrinsically motivated. They are motivated by getting good grades. And the uh, downside of that is they have a reluctance to take risks. They have been proven of also to get anxiety. And overall, I think if we think about the, the educational system, there's a lot of emphasis here and not too much emphasis here. And that's where I think these gamification processes can help. So what is the defining difference between these two? I think the defining difference between the two is their view on failure. So over here, you, need to, you know that you need to fail, you need to challenge yourself in order to learn anything, whereas over here, it's stigmatization. You get a bad grade and it's always on your marks, okay? And, and that's why I think that, that elements from game design can really help, because that's exactly how games are designed. They are particularly designed such that you cannot go through the whole game once and in the one go. When you play Super Mario, you have to die many, many, many times in order to iteratively become better and better, iteratively formulate your own schemes for getting better and learning. And I'm not saying that, that people should necessarily start playing games in, in schools, but I think that all the students could profit from the teachers t thinking a little bit more about, you could call experience points, gaining points, rather than getting subtracted points. And that's what we're working on in the high school. So, so we've... Uh, visited uh, five high schools now with interventions where we go in and, and we have uh, uh, teach, try to teach them the topic, topics. And again, that our main hypothesis is that, that we can do it, we can go into the schools and present it and make it more uh, motivating for them because we come with some authenticity. And, and I just want to, to, to give you a couple of the evaluation results that we have from, from some of the first tests. Uh, this, is, this will go for, for many of the games that, that also you are developing. We're using the most primal part of humans to explore science, which is very good. Quantum physics seems suddenly much more tangible. It should be in every school. That's something that we like to hear. Um, and and uh, over here, someone says that in normal teaching, you really uh, calculate something, whereas when you play this game, you get the feeling of really experiencing what you learn. So that gives a whole new 
dimension to learning, more visual dimension to learning. So when we go into these interventions into high schools, we ask them questions about their experience. And one of the questions that we asked was, are they fun or are they boring? So from a scale from one, which is boring, five, which is fun, if I'm positive, the majority thinks this, this is fun. And then we also ask them, because we, we want them to learn something, we also ask them, did you learn anything by playing the game? And the scales have unfortunately inverted, so that now <laughs> most of them actually thought they didn't learn a lot. This was the first intervention, that's what we are, what we are working on now, be making small visualizations that are closer and closer to the curriculum to give the students the sense of really learning something, apart from having fun. So uh, the process and the dream for us is to create personalized teaching. So in order to create personalized teaching, we need to understand who the student is. And then once we know that, we need to understand and, and, and characterize for that type of student what works well. And, and, and uh, uh, that means that, uh, for instance, we will ask them, well, are you male or female? What, uh, what, is, what is your age? But we'll also ask them questions like, I would like to be better than my fellow students, which is a typical performance uh, orientation one. Or I would like to learn something, which is then, uh, the, the mastery. And then, once we have this established, we have a fairly broad representation of both of them here. Then we can start asking them questions. Did you like gamification? Did you think you learned something? And take different elements of our teaching then, and use this here as an x-axis, and the different elements then as a y-axis, and then look for correlations. So you don't have to look at this here, but it's just that we have something on the x-axis with the type, and something here, which is the method that we used. And the goal is then for us to extract the methods that are optimal for the different types. So that's the long-term game of that. So now we want to educate the players. And uh, I showed you here a first, first iteration of, of how to educate the players. And this is one of our tutorial games. Here, I, didn't show, I showed you a successful game. If I, if I tried to play this game myself, I would fail. Uh, this here is a barrier. If you hit that, or if your atom hits this, then you die. OK? So, 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 so I, had, I had one of my programmers play it and record this so that we could see a successful thing. But uh, it's really difficult to do this. I can invite you to, to try it out later if you want to. Um, again, just like the previous question here, these here are completely unphysical. They have no physical meaning, but they are just introduced in order to teach uh, the players to, uh, to do the performance and have the skills that we think are useful in order to solve the, the scientific tasks that come later. Now also this year will be one of the possibilities of having multiplayer games or also more arcade type games. I mean these here we can have we are working on points here. We're working on uh, these uh, being uh, movable and things like that. And also that's also where the uh, cognitive researchers start to be interested because if you have different decision making processes, you can study that and things like that. So so that's those are some of the things that we're interested in. Apart from that. That was just uh, not learning any physics, but learning the game mechanics. Then we're interested in the quantum computer game and then coming from different, sorry, this is in, in Danish, I see. So there's quantum <laughs> physics. I'll translate it quickly. Classical mechanics, there's algorithms, and there's mathematics. You can come from different directions. And for instance, in the curriculum in, in the high schools, you can have something about this. And then we're hoping that they learn something and they would like to go to the quantum computer game. That's for the teaching. And for the online game, we would like them to, to play this and have the possibility to explore all these different areas. Okay. So, so, so here's, here's a, uh, an example of some of one of these illustration games that we have. Um, it's about splitting wave functions. So understanding the fact that wave functions and atoms can be split and be in two different positions at the same time. Here we have an atom, and then you are allowed to put up a barrier here, so the atom will be moving. You put up an energy barrier, and if you put the energy barrier exactly right, then you can split the atom into two, and you get a score based on whether or not you, uh, how close you came to splitting it 50-50. So that's a game we have just to illustrate it. In the high schools, we had take-home assignments where we said, uh, go home, play this game for 10 minutes, and write a small essay about um, the physics underlying, underlying that. And uh, if you could read Danish, you would know that, uh, that these are fairly reflected uh, uh, essays that come out of that. So it's, it's a, I think, a completely different way of uh, teaching that much more built on, on reflection and, and intuition. Um, so then one of our design considerations always when, or educational design considerations are always when, when teaching quantum mechanics is to start with regular mechanics. So regular mechanics would be a ball rolling in a potential landscape, and that's exactly what we have here. So you're allowed to control the potential landscape now, 
and you are supposed to move it as quickly as possible over here, take out all of the kinetic energy. Okay, so, so that's exactly what we are interested also in the quantum version. We are interested in moving quickly, which means introducing kinetic energy and then taking out the kinetic energy. Do you all know how to take out kinetic energy from something like this, a system like this? Everyone who has a child will have pushed the swing and they know what to do and everyone who's young maybe remember how, what they did when they were swinging. So if you want to do it yourself, then you accelerate twice, right? You need to push with the legs like this and then you need to lean backwards, right? And that's, that's exactly what you need to do. You need to twist this harmonic oscillator with a particular frequency, which is the uh, resonance frequency. And, and we have a small game here where you have a bowl here and the, the ball is oscillating in the bowl and then you are allowed to make this bowl stiffer or, or less stiff. And that's exactly what we are doing when we are kicking and leaning backwards. And that's exactly what you need to do. As it rolls here, you need to then, uh, with twice the period, uh, do this motion here, and then you can put more and more energy into the system. So, so that's in order to illustrate for the players how do you put in kinetic energy into the system. And if you did it with the opposite phase, you could take out energy from the system. So that's in order to educate them a little bit. And we have the quantum version of this here now, and it's exactly the same. So people are really good at playing the first game and really bad at playing the second game just because they get confused by all of this sloshing here. But if they, just, if they could just have looked at the, the position of the center of, of mass, they would have played this very easily. So what you're seeing here is the energy, mean energy of the particle being increased, and, and, uh, and you see that it's much more difficult just because of the representation now. Um, I just want, how much time do I have? Yeah. Okay, then I'll, then I'll just give you a last example here before I take, talk a little bit about a couple of uh, design considerations. So, so another teaching design that we had here was to make the link to a harmonic oscillator. You have the harmonic oscillator equilibrium position x0 of t, and then you have the position of the mass x of t. And uh, then you have Newton's second law describing the system, right? That's what the students knew in the high school. And then we gave them the task take the mass and let it move in a, as a function of time, like this, in a smooth curve like this. So you want to take a mass and move it from here to here smoothly. And then the question is, what do you need to do to x0 of t? Of course, we could integrate and all that, but they didn't know how to integrate. So we posed a problem that was exactly suited for people who know how to differentiate and not integrate. And, and that's what we did here, because you can take Newton's second law, you can isolate x0 of t and x0 of t that was the position of the equilibrium here. As a function of time, it's just given by x of t and the second derivative of x of t. So they could just derive this, uh, to differentiate this here tw twice, and then they have a closed analytic expression for that that they could plot as a function of the mass to stiffness ratio. And then you get different things here. So, so if, if now I took a, a bottle of syrup and I wanted the syrup to move smoothly, then the bottle should also move smoothly, right? Which is... Uh, which is this curve here. But if I took my water here, and I wanted to the water to move smoothly, then I would actually have to move the bottle like this, which is the green curve here. A major overshoot, an undershoot, and then to here. So it's very simple, but now hopefully they understand much, much better how they should transport my atom in order to get the optimal solutions. OK, so the last couple of minutes, I will just touch upon a couple of the design considerations that we have had, and that we um, still have. Community involvement in the design process is something that we think is really important. How do we design a reward structure? How do we design freedom, design freedom into the game, um, and, and design an infrastructure for feedback, which is also really important. If we want to engage them, we have to have an infrastructure for feedback, and we have to have a response also, a feeling that it really pays off to give feedback. Um, then. When we have the design process, there are really two different approaches. There's the Google approach of releasing often and, 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 and having iterative approaches. And then there's the Apple approach of just saying we have a controlled development, we could develop everything in a controlled manner, and then we send it out when it's all working. And I'll show you an example of, of some of the mistakes that we made when we did this. Accessibility is also linked to this here. Do you, when do you, when do you uh, release the version? And, and I'll show you also how, how wrong it can go if you release versions too early. Um, 
And then, then I think we've touched upon this here a little bit of, uh, a couple of times. It's angry birds versus angry nerds, right? Which is, to which extent do we hide the physics and to which extent do we really try to highlight the physics? And I'll also show you a brief example of that. So, so I want to show you the first iteration here of the quantum computer game. We had a beta test, 100 players. This was programmed in MATLAB, because that's what I know, knew how to program. And uh, MATLAB could be compiled. But the problem with the compilation is that you also had to download a runtime environment, which was 300 megabytes. So we had these 100 players. And I was a little bit in panic when we had this. So this was uh, half a year after we started. And I realized how little resources we have and how many things we need to do. So I said, for this beta test, we should define an interface such that the players can play games, develop games, rate games, make level structures, and rate level structures. And you can do all of these things here. OK? So, so I thought, we need to engage people right away. And what happened was we had 100 testers. 80 of them didn't know how to do the installation process, which means now, have, now we have 20. And then we looked at the, they looked at this here, and then 18 out of the 20 looked at this and never knew what they should do, where they should start or anything. So we actually had more or less two players playing this game here. <laughs> so that was a miserable failure. And that was an example of uh, releasing it very, 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 uh, well, having too high ambitions about what to, uh, what to engage the, this participatory design, which I had heard about, and I thought that would be fantastic. And it just didn't work in this way, because they need to be told, they need to have a story about what is the context and need to be explained in a, in a more gentle manner what all of this is about. And that's what we've been working on since then. We tried for the next iteration to uh, highlight a, a couple of, uh, and a sequence of, of different games that we thought were important. We had some documentation on these, each of the games and then the, the, um, the high score that they could see. And they still had the possibilities of going in there, creating new games and things like that. But it was just a much more gentle way to go into that. And I've shown you, this was MATLAB. Uh, showing you just briefly the Java version that we have now. Okay, so 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 then we have the, the the consideration of how much to hide it, and I think so. Everything ranges from 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 angry hamsters to uh, to fold it, right? Where where you say you you try to don't try to gamify a lot, and you try to gamify it uh, uh, a lot. And 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 I just want to show you two examples that we are working on now, on how to create the game environment. Um, so, so one, of the, one of the ideas that we have here for an interface is we have something that looks like this here, very serious, very high-tech, maybe so, sort of augmented reality when you can push these things in and out, swipe them in and out. Um, we have video transfer calls from, from the scientists, and that's the way to do it. So, so I think this, this uh, interface is something, uh, if we characterize it as some something, then it's angry nerds, right? Um, it, it, has, it has the high potential, potential of, of showing authenticity. It's very easy for the players to understand that they're actually contributing to science because they see the science underneath here, right? It's very difficult to make this humoristic and to have something where they laugh because it's just not in the style. And then there's something like this here, which is an alternative, um, where we have this small guy here who walks around. He tells the player what he should do. And, and the whole environment is then set in a tabletop environment where you sit at home, you have your desk and you have pieces of paper, you can slide in your quantum physics for dummies here and your log and you can move everything around. When you play the games, then the obstacles are just things that are randomly placed here. And that's an environment which maybe suits a little bit more casual gaming. Uh, but what I could fear about this here is then that uh, it loses a little bit of the authenticity. So, so people will think of this as a game rather than a participation in research. And, and I think that's one of the open questions where, to, uh, where we should position ourselves for these games. And I don't think that there's one solution for that. <coughs> I think it's very valuable to think about the, in terms of these lines. OK, those were my two minutes. Just wanted to flash some, 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 some photos or, and, and uh, say scienceathome.org again. And if you have any interesting comments or anything, you can come with them now or you can send me an email at chasmfestor.au.dk. Okay, thank you very much.